Today on Chasing Leviathan, we pursue the big question, what does ethical industrial research look like? My guest is Dr. Elena Tallboy, Senior Research Manager at Microsoft. We discuss misinformation and malinformation in social media. And I think it's important to note that I was recovering from COVID in this episode, so any missteps or mistakes are my own and no fault of Dr. Talboy. So come, have a seat with us and learn to listen with me. So uh, tell me a little bit like how, so we're talking about what is the importance of ethics in industri- industrial research. Tell me a little bit how you got into this. A, a lot of it has to deal with statistics. A lot of it has to do with the right way of asking questions, that sort of thing. Uh, what, what guided you on this journey? Oh, man. All right. So I, whew. all right. So when I was doing my PhD, my my research expertise is in judgment and decision making and more specifically probabilistic reasoning. So how do we use numbers to make decisions? And I am that person that absolutely loves numbers. I will talk about them all day. I taught statistics for six years. Like it is one of my favorite things in the world. And I know like people hate statistics, but I love it. Um, but, you know, it it comes out in so much of our lives. Like, we deal with statistics almost every single day. And we deal with probabilistic mm. reasoning almost every single day. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example of when you drive to work in the morning, you know, you have any number of routes that you can take. And you may not even realize you're doing a mental calculation of what's the probability that I'm going to make it to work on time if I take this back road versus sitting on uh, in Orlando I-4. You know, (laughs) (laughs) there is that calculation happening in our head. That is a type of probabilistic reasoning. When you think about the weather, now Florida is its own case because it rains every day, but in other places when the weather says there's a 30% chance of showers, what does that actually mean? Like, is right. it 30% of the area? Is it 30% of the day? Is it 30% of every hour? You know, there's any right. number of interpretations. We know there's a right one, but most people don't think about that. And so right. these are the, the areas that got me really interested in understanding how probability fits into our daily lives and how it influences the decisions we make. and. You know, we talked a little bit about like data representation with COVID. That is Mm. a huge part of what I harp on a lot is when you represent data, there are right ways to do it. And there are other ways. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, Yeah, and I I, I love that. So... So you're you're getting your PhD in this. Yes. And you're like, what we need is to talk about the ethics of probability in industrial yes. research. Yes. So talk to me about that transition from just like the love of numbers. Yep. To you know what? Numbers have ethics built into them. They and do. that's really fascinating to me. It is because so as a, a formally trained researcher, I went mm. through an entire research ethics series. And one of the cornerstones of this foundational research is the Belmont Report. And it's talking about some of the atrocities that happened in the name of human research. And oh, yeah. it's, it's ugly. Like, scientists have done some pretty awful things in the name of science. Um, oh, yeah. 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 And so, you know, we get a lot of training in this in formal PhD programs where we talk about how do we respect persons? How do we minimize harm and maximize benefit? What is it that we're doing that is ultimately going to help humanity in ways that we hope it does? You know, we really have to care about the impact this is going to have not only on our research participants, the people actually engaging in our studies, but on the larger community in which this research is going to go out into. And so 
as you can tell, I'm I'm pretty uh, hyped up about this topic. I get yeah. very involved and invested because it's something that's so important to me. And then yeah. I go to industry research. And this is where I leave academia and join industry and start conducting research in this user research space. So how do we improve our products for the customer? How do we improve these experiences? And I start to look at the work that's been done in some of these spaces. And the the biggest example you'll see is like Facebook currently rebranded as Meta. Oh my gosh, they're in the news every other day for doing something completely unethical. And it's a big problem, you know, and and Facebook is an easy target (laughs) to say, like, you know, but they're not the only ones. There are, um, you know, we have digital consultants misusing the data of millions of users to push or nudge people to make decisions they may or may not want to make. And they're not informed and they're not told about these things. There was in 2017. Someone created an AI generated gaydar app to figure out who in your friend circle is gay that you might be able to date, not realizing the ultimate harm that it is doing to an already marginalized community. These are problems. These are big problems. And we. Yeah, that couldn't be misused at all. Right? (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Never going to be a problem. Like, but this is the, this is the issue is that. When you're talking about industry research, you're talking about doing and creating products that are going to be immediately available, which in my mind means you need to be even more on top of the ball of ethics and ethical considerations than even in academia, because academia moves at the pace of a dinosaur. Like, it's slow. Industry is like, boom, 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 let's go, let's go. You need right. to stop and think. <laughs> and so this is, this is kind of where I got into this space and started talking about the ethics of industry research and why it is so vital to think about these problems. Yeah, execution over planning often, uh, one of the unseen costs is often ethics, right? Yeah. And that's a very an industry forward type of thing. Uh, you know, I mentioned that my day job is digital marketing and uh, once you understand, uh, we, one of, one of the things that I is a big deal to me and I, I want to have a guest on to talk more about it is how we are literally tinkering with people's neurochemistry with these apps yes. and <laughs> like, and like, they don't even realize what they, everyone kind of knows, but yeah. like the, the, the introduction of infinite scroll and the yeah. fact that everyone's going to it in order to compete with each other and yeah. what that does to the consumer without the consumer being asked is yep. it's unbelievable it is and in 2020 the creator of the infinite scroll actually went on a speaker tour to apologize for the impact his work had and to bring awareness to the psychological and societal ills of this technology like this is the person who created this stuff and they are out here apologizing for it you know, and, and again, yeah. Facebook or Meta is an easy punching bag. They were literally just in the news April 2022 for, again, six months of purposeful, manipulative, psychological harm to their user base. And nothing's going to happen from it. Yeah. Uh, like it's, nothing, well, nothing's going to happen to Facebook or Meta. It's going to happen to the customers or the people using the platform. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, they're going to make, and it, this is one of those things that our society kind of struggles with, is that they make so much money off the harm that yeah. even if they are legally penalized, they can pay the money for it and still come out with a profit. So it's still worth it to them. And that but- is what you see in technology. <laughs> it's not how much money can we invest up front to avoid these things. It's mm. how much do we have to pay when people find out what we've been doing. And yes. that dichotomy is so personally infuriating (laughs) and (laughs) it's just like I want to shake the person and be like what are you thinking like we're harming people we need to stop doing this like it's not a slap on the wrist for the people who are harmed it's literally Mm. changing their lives yes yes I uh used to be um a youth pastor and I used to be a high school teacher And in both those cases, as TikTok came out, I wanted to engage with it in digital marketing, right? 
And so I used it. And I personally was like, why am I on this for two to three hours at a time? And if you look at the way it's used, that's what pe people are like. Well, they're, they're 20 to 30 second videos. The yeah. average user uses it at least an hour at a time. That's like the like, if not more. And it's yeah. like, it, and which is actually, which is funnily enough, YouTube has longer videos, but YouTube isn't used like that because it doesn't give you that just insane, um, uh, starts with a, it starts with a D, the, uh, a dopamine endorphins, surge. yeah, dopamines. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, it's, it's exactly what's going on. Um, yeah, you're I, hitting I, that I, reward center in your limbic system over and over and over again, and you're getting a hit every 20 or 30 seconds. It is mm. literally the foundation of an addiction. Now, I'm not an, yeah. a specialist or an expert in this area, but that is where that goes. Oh, everyone, like, I don't think anyone is going to debate with you that social media is addicting. I think everyone knows that. I haven't talked to a single person who's like, no, nah, it doesn't do that to me. Like, <laughs> Like everyone's like, I just need to spend. In fact, I would say almost every single person I've talked to, unless they're not on it, says I need to spend less time. Like if you did a poll like to listeners, like, you know what your immediate reaction is like, should you be spending less time on social media? Always. Yes. Absolutely. Everyone, everyone says yes. So yeah. it's not that's this isn't like what's interesting about this is that we're just on the cusp, the beginning of this new technology. And yeah. We are. <laughs> and so everyone knows what's happening, but we haven't figured out what we're going to do about it yet. And so what? Go ahead. So I'll add one more wrinkle to this for you. So sure. we know the emotional cost. We know the time sink. We know that we feel bad after using it. And we know that yes. the social media sites are purposely manipulating content to mm. increase the appearance of negative stuff, to increase engagement, because negative gets mm. more hits than positive. Right. Let me add one more layer here. Where is your data? And who oh, is yeah. accessing your data? And how much data do they really have? Something that people don't actually realize is this thing called off Facebook data, or even on Twitter, off Twitter data. These social media sites are tracking your movements across the internet, even when you are not on their website. All yeah. right. And now you start to think right. about things like the metaverse and mm -hmm. what is considered data in the metaverse. Is it your eye movements? Did you know you can be identified by a combination of different virtual reality movements? Like, this is all your personally identifiable information. And do you even know that it's being collected? Um, it's a lot. Oh, no. I, it like, literally, I think it was like six or seven years ago. The and I'm, we again, it's the kind of the backbone to things we already know. The value of personal data surpassed the value of oil. Yep. Like it's it is the biggest resource in the world now is that the ability to control people's attention and to know exactly what people want um yep. and <laughs> um but i so these are the harms right this is these this is where harms. we're talking yes. about industrial <laughs> research why is it important we are dealing with this every day um I, I i've been floating kind of this uh reformulation of machiavelli to go back to what you said about negative content it is easier to scare someone it's easier to scare than to inspire yeah. And I think because to inspire someone is actually more powerful, but it's harder to do. It's like it's it's better to be loved. Uh, it's better to be feared than loved. Right. It's very similar. And that's exactly what we see. Um, even uh, what's interesting is social media's uh, kind of lateral effect, if I could put it that way, on journalism and how journalism has become more clickbait in order to compete. Right. So it's there's yeah. all these things where we're releasing this. And we're just doing what's effective, uh, and it's guided by guided by the dollar. So, how do you? <laughs> so, how do you make sure that you're asking the right questions when you do industry research? What questions should people at, in, in these technical spaces be asking uh, instead of maybe like, how long can we keep users on? <laughs> yeah. Like what questions should what questions are they asking and what questions should they be asking? Yep. So as as the researcher in the room, I am there to represent the customers. I am the voice of the customer in a sense, you know, because they they don't have a direct seat at the table often. You know, that's what research is there to do. 
So as that stand in for the customers, I want to know, is this going to help me? Is this going to harm me? Is this going to do anything for my family? And what is it going to do? And then as the researcher, I need to ask, does this maximize benefits? Does it minimize harm? What is at stake? Are we considering all the people who are potentially going to use this, as well as all the people who might not? And do we care about who's in the room versus who is not in the room? You know, and as a researcher, and my expertise is in human biases and heuristics and how we make decisions. I own right up front. I'm a human. I am biased. I have yes. mental shortcuts that I use. That is just the way brains work. I need to acknowledge that because I need other people to acknowledge that too. You know, we yep. all have these shortcuts that we use. It's only through working together and really hammering out these details and really identifying our assumptions that we can undo some of the bias that gets built into these products. And so mm. you have to have a person and it's typically the researcher who comes in and says, like, what are your assumptions here? Like, who do you expect to use this? Who do you not expect to use this? And that's a really important consideration that research brings to the table. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, really struck by like most of this is seems, I wouldn't say common sense, but just really solid, right? That you're saying like, it's not, you know, <laughs> while I understand it is controversial because it's not done, uh, <laughs> it's not really controversial, right? Like everyone's like, yeah, that would be nice. That would be, those are nice questions to ask, but Everyone I talk to says that, like, <laughs> yeah, of course we do these things. Of oh, yeah. course. And it's like, but do yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. No, I, man, we just had, well, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't talk about clients. Yeah, we've definitely had, like, everyone pays lip service to these. And then they're like, hey, can you do this for us? And we're like, no, that's actually illegal. I know it doesn't seem like it would actually hurt anybody, but you that's not your information to just take. Like, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and it, yep. and as soon as that was explained to them, they were fine with it, but they didn't think about what they were doing, right? Like it's just like it's it's easy to do that. It's like, yes, it is, and we should not. The um but you the, the phrase you used there that was really fascinating to me is thinking about the people who may not use it. Uh can you give me a couple examples of what that is and what that question represents? So in the product space, usually in industry research, research is a reactive process is that people come to the research team and say, hey, we need data to support this. Um, and it's, it's a very different way of working from academia where you get to ask questions that no one has thought about before. It's very proactive. Yeah. It's trying to push the envelope. Um, so industry research is a bit more reactive and it's not a, you know, this, I'm having a blanket statement. It's not this way right, all right. the time, but in general. So you'll get a research question that says, Hey, I need to know why, why my customers really love this product. That's not on market yet <laughs> because they need to create marketing materials. Yes. And it's like, well, do you know they love them? <laughs> and so the question that comes up that I often ask my partners is, hey, what are you going to do if the research comes back and is not supporting your beliefs that people love this? Like, are you going to change direction? Are you going to go with what the customer says? And sometimes they do, <laughs> you know, and, uh, sometimes they don't. And I'm just being yeah. honest here. Like, it's yes. not yeah. always the easiest yeah. job in the world um but you have to be willing to like stand up for your customers and say like no this is not what they want um and yeah. it takes a bit of a uh, thick skin to get through some of these conversations so yeah that's oh absolutely uh <laughs> is there something uh hmm I think uh, what what are some common things that customers can look out for, or should be aware of when they are they are making decisions uh, in what they're buying and what they're choosing, where they're choosing to spend their time. Uh, obviously, like the data side of it is important, um, but are there other are there other ways that they can improve their own decision making? so that they can make better decisions um, 
and, and maybe in, in in some way provide like a uh, an ethereal seat at the table because they <laughs> they're able yeah. to know a little bit more how things are yes. are handled. Yeah. So when when people are using data to make decisions um, and they're trying to decide if they want to buy a product and they're looking at the data that goes with the product, there are a lot of really clear cut questions. But I will warn you, it takes time and it Mm -hmm. takes mental effort and it takes a bit of reflection. And these are things that get very exhausting, very quickly. Um, You know, we are limited in our cognitive resources, but if it's an important decision, we really do need to slow down and take that time to consider it. And so Mm. some of the questions I ask myself is, what is represented in the data? What am I actually seeing? Um, Mm. Where does this data come from? Who generated this data? Can I even find that information? is all of the relevant information available? Do I have a full picture? Do I have a small slice of the reality that they're presenting to me? Um, another big one, is this confirming something I already believe? And this is oh, huge yeah. for fake news. It's like, it is so much easier to see something and go, yeah, I already knew that. Of course that's true. And it's <laughs> not. Like this confirmation yes. bias is massive. So is this something I already believe? And should I believe it? Do I need to go find something that goes against my beliefs and see mm. both sides of the picture? Um, the, and the last the really one interest- is- Sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, what's really interesting about that is like, even your belief can be true and your, your evidence that you're is confirming your true belief could be false. Correct. Which is- which is uh, like kind of mind blowing for some people. They're like, well, I know this is true. And it's like, you're right, but that's not, that's but it's not, not, what you it's not. So, <laughs> you know, what you believe and your opinion is not the same thing as fact. And they should not be treated equally. And people tend to conflate the two things. So yes. I can have an opinion about a set of facts and my opinion can go against those facts, but that doesn't make me right. That just makes me have an opinion. (laughs) (laughs) You're about to give a last question, though. I I, I, sorry. I did not mean to. I thought you were done. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So this goes back to the the social media as does this evoke an emotional response? Do I Mm. feel good reading this or do I feel good learning this or do I feel angry or do I feel sad? And again, going back to those negative emotions, those negative emotions increase engagement, which in turn increases ad revenue for whatever company it is you're looking at. And so the more angry you are, the more upset you get, the more money you are generating for someone else. So if you feel your emotions coming into it, step back, take a look, take a breath and think about what your actions are actually doing. Yeah. If it's free, you are the product. If it's right? free, you are yeah. the product. So yes. every single one of these social media platforms, it's Reddit, it's Twitter, it's Weibo, it's every single social media app out there. You are the product because you are not paying for it. Right. Right. The um, yeah, spoiler alert, I am not on Facebook anymore. Um, but it's, it, it, that let, this is in response to your last question, which I think is such a good one because during the, uh, Clinton and Trump, uh, presidential race, (laughs) I was spent for like, for like two or three weeks, I would get on Facebook for about half an hour every night. I would type something out and I had very firm beliefs that Facebook was not a good place to have arguments. And so for two or three weeks. I got on every night, I typed something out and then I deleted it. And I just like, I was just really angry the rest of the night. And that went on for two or three weeks. And I was like, why? (laughs) It's not going to change anything. Like all I'm doing is just being angry. So I just deleted my account. And I, you know, I, I cheat. Like my wife, uh, if I need to get a hold of someone, my wife still has her Facebook because she wants to keep track of baby pictures. And so, you know, but do you know how many times I've used my wife's Facebook account to get in touch with someone. I, I thought I would use it at least a couple times. Never. I've never used it. It's been five, six years. And I just look at that and I was like, well, I, you know, you're like, I, I, how will I get in touch with people? And it's like, 
<laughs> the truth is, you will find a way. Like, or you just don't like you don't need to know and find all these people only through Facebook. If you, the only way you know someone is through Facebook, then you probably aren't going to reach out to them. And so it's just it, I that uh, was a key question for me in deciding to just like just to leave it. And my life has been better ever since. Doesn't mean I haven't experimented with other social media um, and, you know, had the same exact problems. But <laughs> at least Facebook, <laughs> the original sin <laughs> is gone. Yep. <laughs> no. So um, I still ahead. have social media accounts. I, I yeah. have a Facebook page. I have LinkedIn, Twitter, Reddit. And well, you have a book, a so <laughs> I have a book. Yeah, so I, yes. I published a book, and so I have to have a way to reach people. But it's right. funny that you bring up that you just use your your wife's social media because there are times where I'll be like arguing online, and I, I am terrible at this. I am so terrible. There's someone wrong on the <laughs> internet, and my partner will look at me and go, "Why are you arguing on the internet?" Just <laughs> Yes. It's yep. like, I know, but they're wrong. And like, <laughs> there are times where I like let myself get carried away with that. And then I have to like rein it back in and go, no, this is dumb. I'm not fighting on the internet. I'm going to stop. <laughs> but yeah, it's, easy. I, I, it's easy to get oh, sucked it's into so it. It's so easy. Oh, yeah. That's actually, I built a Twitter account, met some nice people through like small groups, like uh, there were certain chats and stuff. Um, but uh, literally fi figured out like on Twitter, and this happens on most social uh, places, but the way that Twitter operates, because every social media uh, platform has its own quirks. The way yep. Twitter especially operates, the way everyone has access to everything. There are literally, I figured out there's a person who's, I, and I know there's just lots of people like this, who literally was spending six to nine hours a day just going around and looking for people to... Uh, kind of police and correct and so <laughs> and i've just one that i'm like what like a miserable a existence spend a day oh i like i was like this person is so miserable you know um and i i'm not here to make fun of that person i it was uh actually i think they were on disability so i think they're just at home they can't they don't go out right yeah and they just and so that that's what they do and uh that was kind of the like I ended up deleting my account <laughs> on there too. Uh, I still have other ones. I do, uh, I, I do uh, like Reddit and stuff like that. But I try not to spend a lot of time. Uh, a lot of the reason I started the podcast is in response to the lack of long form discussion and the value of just like if you're going to have a, an argument, you know, and really get somewhere, that's going to take a long time. And the odds of you doing it and understanding someone's intonation through text mm -hmm. is, <laughs> it's like, no, no, it's like, this isn't going to happen, <laughs> especially with other people chiming in and like, and people get on social media to release steam. They don't get on to actually like debate. And yeah. so, uh, and for me, this isn't even a, a debating forum, like just that idea of like, I can, uh, what I want to do is create a platform where people can listen to someone all the way through because it's amazing how often the conversations break down like on social media because before someone can even finish their thought someone else jumps in and just creates this magnificent straw man that is just like <laughs> <laughs> so it, sorry oh. I, obviously you know this is near and dear to my heart I, i'm really uh enjoying the conversation before we go any further i do want to make sure i, I mention this because you know you you <laughs> I know this is part of it, right? Why do you have a Facebook page? Because you have a book. And I, I think this is an important book. Like, I, as someone who, fit, who got their master's, what I wish I knew a field guide for thriving and graduate would have been very timely for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah. yeah, talk so, to me a little bit about the book. Yeah, so the book actually came out of... Uh, very similar uh, background, actually. So I was having these conversations on Twitter. I'm very active in the academic Twitter and science Twitter communities. And I was spending a lot of time talking to people. And, you know, that 240 character limit really doesn't allow much room for nuance. <laughs> no, um, it doesn't. 
So I started having what I called Friday afternoon coffee chats. And this was 15 minutes or a half hour where someone could book my time completely free. I, I'm a huge fan of giving back to the community that gave me so much. And so I want to make sure I'm helping other people in the same way that I got help. And so that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I still do these conversations today. You can go to my website and book them right now. Um, Sadly, I'm booked out for two months, so maybe not right now, but like in the future. What a future. surprise. Yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> like someone's giving free advice about graduate school. Please. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. <laughs> so I started having these conversations with these graduate students who were, you know, struggling with their workload or they're dealing with a really crappy advisor who never answers email or even worse, they are the abusive advisor that you hear these horror stories about. Um and then there's the group of academics who are at the end of their degree and they swallowed this line, hook, line, and sinker that they're going to get a tenure track position when in reality only 3% of academics will. You know, it is, and it's hard. And it's, it's one of those conversations of like, well, I did all this stuff, now what? And, you know, yeah. there's no formal training for how to go from industry, you know, from academia to industry. And so I saw this huge gap and just started helping people figure out how to do it. And yeah. then I started writing it down. <laughs> um, and so now because you're tired of saying it over and over again. Yeah, you're well, like, I said I... it so many times. And oh, I yeah. went through it myself. And oh, my gosh, my friends. I love my friends. They are the most phenomenal people because they heard me and listened to me agonize about this decision to stay yeah. in academia or leave. And I talked about it for weeks and like, <laughs> you know, so shout out to my friends and my partner for being amazing people for that um, and helping me and just letting me kind of go through the process and come to my own decision. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, you need that's why that's why we need community though. Uh that's yeah. uh, man, my my wife is so patient with me. My kids are patient with me. They're like, <laughs> they're like <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, I, I could tell like my my son is 7. Yeah, I have a 7-year-old, a 4-year-old and one on the way. And uh already I I just like dad, dad, we know. Like you, you dad, you don't have to <laughs> the the it's such a that's such a blessing and uh, it's it's great to hear you say that um that's that's really cool yeah uh so that kind of came out of those conversations starting with you and your own personal journey and it then did. moving on to these yeah. uh apparently f still free conversations if you are going to grad school in the next six months as you know i'm sure <laughs> a lot of people out. are yeah um uh, that's that's really awesome uh Kind of returning to our original, our kind of main topic, uh, I did want to touch on that because I did think that was fascinating. Um, when you talk about those decisions, you know, you talked about confirmation bias. Uh, what are some other data dealing decision making that people struggle with? Um, you know, I, I automatically think of, I know just the basic like correlation versus causation, right? Correlation like, versus <laughs> causation. Yep. It's so um, but uh, are, are there some really common ones you think are really important? And do you have any uh, clear examples of like just that people can think about practically yeah. uh, that would help them? Yeah. So I so there there's two different directions. I'll go for this one. Uh, so sure. one is uh, a human bias. I just published a paper on in the frontiers in psychology that I named the value selection bias. <laughs> And so okay. I am a big fan of practical and pragmatic. So, you know, no sexy names here. It's just a very simple. <laughs> um, you're, you're not the Monty Hall problem, you know, I, you don't have. No. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a situation where you are trying to reason through a bunch of difficult information. Um, you've likely never encountered this type of problem before. You don't really mm. know how to solve the problem. Um, very common in mathematical situations. So where numbers are involved, of course, coming yes. back to my uh, sure. love and joy, is when we encounter these situations, we often rely on the information that is presented to us as it is presented. And we use that as our answer to the problem. 
And so if you think about a situation where it says, like, you have a 70% chance of having this thing go wrong. And there's a whole bunch of other information provided in the problem. But that's the salient bit of information that you get out of it. There's 70% chance this is going to go wrong. Doesn't matter what the other context is. Doesn't matter what other information is there. You are more likely to use that number as like, yeah, there's a 70% chance there's something going to go wrong. Doesn't matter anything else. Like nothing else gets encoded there. Uh, So you rely on the most salient information that's presented to you. And you might not think about like, is there missing context here? Or maybe there's another consideration to take into account. Or maybe this other data that's presented with this salient point should be evaluated. Okay. Um, and it might not be. <laughs> so Yeah. Can you give a can you give a concrete example of that? Because I I think I know what you're talking about, but I'm I'm just struggling to grasp it a little bit. So a very simple example of this is take a home pregnancy test Mm -hmm. all right you know that when you take this test there is some likelihood that it is going to come out with a true positive or a false positive or a true negative or a false negative so you know actually being pregnant when you are test tells you you're pregnant but you're not the test tells you you're not pregnant but you are or the test tells you you're not pregnant and you're not so there's a whole set of outcomes here right yes so yes So when we consider this type of a problem from a mathematical standpoint, and we ask people what's the likelihood that you're actually going to be pregnant if the test tells you you're going to be pregnant. If you've never encountered this situation and the salient information that's given to you says, you know, 70% of women who are pregnant get a pregnant, get a positive result, you're going to think, yeah, that's an absolutely accurate test. I'm going to get a pregnant result and I'm going to be pregnant. Like, Or it's not, it's going to say I'm not pregnant and I'm not pregnant. And we take that result at face value and we ignore the other context of those, um, those conditional statements of like, maybe you are, but you're really not, you know, the test says one thing, but in reality, it's something else. So Mm -hmm. these are, this is where the value selection bias comes in is that you're given a piece of salient information. And that decision is based solely on that information, ignoring the rest of the context. Kind of oversimplifying situations so that it's to the point where, oh, it's good enough. You know, 70% that's good enough. (laughs) It's good enough. And it, it brings to mind a question of, you know, how much information is enough to make an informed decision? Do you need every single piece of data to make an informed decision? Or is, is there like an MVP of data knowledge, you know, like pulling an industry term in here, you know? Yeah. yeah. But it, it's an interesting question of, you know, if we do rely on surface level information in situations where we're not familiar with everything that goes into it, how bad is that? And it can be really bad. And it's really bad in the case of things like um, disinformation campaigns and misinformation Mm -hmm. and malinformation. And when we get these kind of superficial debates on social media, (laughs) bringing it back around to this topic. Yeah, sure. sure. um, We we've never encountered this before. You know, social media is still so new in the history of humanity. We have had like five to 10 to 20 years of this and that's it. And so a lot of these problems that we're encountering are still very novel to us. And we don't know how to think about what's not there. We can't know what we don't know. Um, And so this kind of superficial decision making where we rely on what is presented to us is a serious problem. (laughs) Um, Something we should be aware of. Yeah, it's something I kind of about once a month, I just stop and think about. And I think it's a good thing to think about that it's all encompassing now and it's everywhere now but 10 years ago social media didn't really exist yeah like it was like a weird thing on the internet you know it was it's like it was like we had had yahoo chat rooms and icq (laughs) (laughs) and it's and so and what's interesting is people are talking about ai and that is going to be important but what i don't think people think of social media because they think of it as a a hobby and entertainment, a way to blow off steam. They don't take it seriously. And I don't think they realize that that is the revolution. 
right? Like this is like, we are literally manipulating people's brains. Cause that's like, yeah. it's rewiring people's brains. Like when you look it at, is. um, are you familiar with Nicholas Carr's, uh, the shallows? Mm -mm. Okay. So he, like they did a study where they took people, I don't know where they found these people, but this is impressive. They found people who didn't use Google. Oh, and they did, and they had them use Google, uh -huh. and they had people who regularly use Google, and they did, um, not MR, MR uh, brain imaging okay. while they were doing it. And the people whose brains uh, were accustomed to using Google, it, the, the place where they used it was like, uh, the, that part of the brain was like twice the size or something like that. Oh, wow. Uh, and it was, like the, it was like the area that was lighting up was like twice the size, something like that. Um, I don't remember exactly how it goes. He's talking about how like neuroplasticity is something we think is only for kids, but it's actually for adults too. It is. They repeated the experiment after having the people who hadn't used Google. And this is not social media. This is just Google search. Just Google. Two weeks. Yep. And they had the same, they had the same brave uh, brain function. That's all it took to rewire their brain. I'm like, and Google search is in no way as powerful as social media. I'm like, well, I can't imagine. Oh, oh, I will maybe not. Actually, I will argue <laughs> okay. you on that point because okay, yeah. When you think about Google, it is an yes. AI driven. It's an algorithm, and it yes. learns what you prefer based on right. your personal search history. So not yes. only when you tell someone to go Google it, you're yes. telling them to go confirm their own biases because the way the algorithm is generating these results is based on your previous search history. So you're not ah. going to find things that go against your beliefs because the algorithm is designed to confirm your beliefs. So telling someone to go do your research on Google is not, <laughs> it's not doing your research. It's not like stop using that phrase. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, yeah. It's so interesting. That brings up a whole nother layer of things. I, I laughed. I had uh, Marisa Zalabak. Uh, she's on the uh, board for ethics, AI ethics for IEEE. Okay. I had her on. And um, uh, she said, you know, uh, we were talking about, I was like, what are some more resources, you know, for learning how to deal with ethics and AI? She's like, well, I mean, just start by Googling it. And I'm like, seems like uh, there's... <laughs> see i was like I, I i literally like like in the middle of it was just like doesn't that seem like there's a like uh compromised interest what's the what, conflict of interest here i mean <laughs> i like what I, I i'm pretty sure google's gonna have its own say on uh, ai ethics um but yeah that's really that's really fascinating i i, I think what i meant is the dopamine effect of google versus social but i could be wrong in that too that's just my that's just my intuition which as we know <laughs> could definitely be right or wrong right so um when i said that about about that yeah i know like google's algorithm i mean just the sheer amount of information I, I think one of the things and you know you mentioned academia coming along at a dinosaur's pace like media critical skills uh media critical thinking skills are going to be is needs to very quickly become one of the most important things yeah like whereas for a long time we were it was about teaching people things now it's about how to learn and how yes. to critically think is going to be more and more important because at this point i mean i homeschool my son and like we do like a science curriculum but to be honest it's nothing compared to like he just asks me questions and whereas in the past we'd have to like i remember getting oh, oh, like opening an encyclopedia yeah now he just like he's just like hey dad can you youtube this and it's nope. like, there's like eight different documentaries that he can immediately watch on whatever it is. And he comes back and he's like, squids have blue blood and they have teeth in their arms. I'm like, well, that's going to give me nightmares, but thanks. Um, not that you, <laughs> not, yeah. I'm sure you don't experience any of that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, sorry, I, 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 you know, I, again, I, I'm having a great time. This is so fascinating to me. Uh, yeah. Is there something that you wanted to share? I feel like you were, you were about to say something. Yeah. So you brought up the idea of media literacy. And this is actually mm. the, the next book I'm working on is the different types of literacy we need to actually be informed decision makers in the modern day. And, you know, media literacy is one of them. You know, we yeah. have 
In the US, we have a curriculum focused predominantly around STEM, English, and writing skills. And in a modern day, we need not only those regular, you know, kind of core literacies, we need additional literacies like statistical literacy, where data is being manipulated not only by news agencies, but political organizations, healthcare organizations. We need computer literacy. How much time of the day do we spend on computers? You know, and the pandemic threw this into such a strong relief that mm. computer literacy skills are lagging. And there are some cases where our kids know more about computers than we do as fully grown adults, you know? And I grew up in the 80s and the growing up with computers. And there are things my son can do on his computer that I just look at him and go, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And I worked at Microsoft. Like, I should yeah. know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, like, there's computer literacy that's going there. There's yeah. media literacy. How do we understand what is controlling our media? Who has a say in it? Why has it become this clickbait type of news outlet? Mm. Um, one of the questions I didn't bring up earlier when you asked about what should people be asking is, who is yep. paying for this? And oh, this yeah. is so important in media literacy. When you think about the different news organizations that we have, and you start to go up the hierarchy of who owns these companies. The different, yes. <laughs> different news. Yeah, and so these are all types of literacy that we need to understand. And we need to understand that not only is, are all of these literacies required, we need to understand that as a language, science mm. And scientific terminology means something very different than it does to someone who's not trained in science. And so there, there's all these issues going forward that we really need to take a strong look at our curriculum um, and how we teach people these different things going forward. Because it's not just STEM and English anymore. It's so much more. And, and even STEM, it doesn't really provide literacy, no. right? I mean, it that's does, like, it, I just. It gives you like the, it gives you the language base. It teaches you the words, but like the way I use the word hypothesis and doing my research and having no. my assumptions and biases is going to be very different from someone on Facebook saying, well, go do your research. You know, these are two very different things. Yeah. Yeah. I just had um, uh, Dr. Chris uh, Haufa. From, um, and he was talking about how science grows. And he's, one of the things that just got highlighted, and this is, we talked, no worries. The, one of the things, you know, COVID and the way that people just don't understand how science works, even like, and I know this is a surprise, but even politicians not understanding how science works, you know, even yeah. going back to the, like uh, the amount of, uh, our, our world is rapidly becoming more complex and we have not been given the skills to deal with it. Like that was so evident, even like, uh, you know, we were talking about Facebook and the Facebook hearings, listening to the congressman ask those questions to Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> you're like, so like, how do you make money? It's like, surely, surely you could have been briefed on that. Like, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, it's, it, it, uh. <laughs> Yeah, but again, and this is really fascinating, you mentioned this, your son, and you're very computer literate. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I, your son does things that you don't understand on the computer. And yeah. this is something where like, so now we have these uh, politicians who, someone mentioned this, we've only had one president who uh, went to a non-segregated school, or went to a, yeah, went to a non-segregated school, which is a really crazy thing to think about for a second yeah and when you think about the changes that have happened in this short amount of time it's like it, 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 you have these politicians who have risen to the top over decades of experience and then they get to the top and then they don't have that they they've worked so hard and they have so much to get there to the top and all the skills that got them to the top have not prepared them for the decisions that they have to deal with and that's a, that's a charitable reading of it. There's also some other <laughs> less charitable ways of thinking about it, but surely that's some of it, right? Like right? we all have grandparents, like, or, or not all of us. Some people have grandparents who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s. And when they face technology, that's a different road than someone who 
grew up in the 80s with computers. Like that's just I it, it's a different it's a different thing. Um <laughs> I'm obviously speaking of talking too much. All right. I I want to make sure that I'm I am asking you the right questions. I want to hear like uh one of the questions I really wanted to ask too. What are the most common ethical pitfalls you encounter in industry research? All right. <laughs> So I, if that doesn't get you in trouble, if that doesn't get you in trouble, I realize I'm not. No. So, so in, I did a lot of, um, healthcare research and health outcomes mm. research and, you know, how do people make decisions using data when it comes to their personal health? And this is something mm. I am super outspoken about. <laughs> is okay. That yeah. I'll give you an example to, to frame it up for you. So. Everyone knows the most common heart attack symptoms. They are tightness in your chest, pain shooting down your arms, fatigue, you know, those kind of symptoms. But usually when you get that sharp pain in your chest, that's like your big indicator that you're going to have a heart attack, right? No. Nah. <laughs> so this is true for men. All right. And this is the problem with healthcare research is that we have had so much of the research done using what I refer to as the default male, expecting yeah. that everyone is going to conform to the default male. But when you start to look at women and see how much heart attacks are underreported in women and how they actually pass away more often because the symptoms are not the same. Symptoms for women are things like indigestion and nausea and tiredness and full body aches. Hmm. Sounds like a f stomach flu to me, right? You know, but right, that's, right. that's a symptom of a heart attack for a woman. Hmm. And so these are gender differences in healthcare that are just completely swept away. And now it's starting to get steam and we're starting to get some exposure to these things. Um, and that's just one example of it. So I actually pulled up something because I wanted to talk to you about this. Sure. Yeah. Is, uh, give me one second. Let me uh, actually, if I could just add, and I, I could be wrong in this, I, I should, you know, I, I won't say just Google it. Right. But I'm pretty sure like a good example of this was when they first brought out airbags. Yeah. They tested them. They tested them on the average male weight. And then yep. they put kids up there and yep. kids died. Yeah. Right. And you put because women they didn't up think there about women die. Yeah. Because the yeah. height difference is there. Yes. It's the same yes. exact thing. And yes. so, you know, women have an entirely different set of medical. Condition. And this is just one example. Mm. Right. And right. medicine has used the default male for so long that most of our medical findings are based on men. And now, so this is an issue when you start to think about like women's health issues. You know, women have entire reproductive system that men don't have and it causes problems. And women are just told like it's normal to be in pain a week, a month for the majority of their life. If I ever went to you as a as a man and said, like, you're going to be in pain a week, a month for the rest of your life, you would look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not. Why are women expected to deal with this pain? And so, OK, so there's gender differences. Sure. Now let's think about cultural differences and think sure. about this in terms of mental health problems. So in the U.S., we treat mental health problems as a failing of an individual. And we don't mm. treat it as a neurochemical imbalance in their brain. It is a physiological problem that we have. You know, it's a neurochemical problem. But that's in the U.S. When we go to other cultures that are more collectivistic in nature, that take care of a familial model, and you care about your local community, and you care about your society, they don't treat it as an individual problem. They treat it as a community problem that this person needs more support and more help, and maybe we need to change the way we're doing things. And so we miss this entire cultural separation that is caused by being individualistic versus cultural or uh, community-minded in some ways. And so, mm. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's 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 really important. I don't think people understand, uh, generally speaking, how often this stuff just happens, right? It, it's 
uh, because it gets masked behind what well the statistics say. And people all n- never feel comfortable arguing with statistics. And it's actually yep. very easy to argue with statistics. It is. Um, so when you're faced with, go ahead. Yes, I love this quote. Yes. <laughs> so, but here's the thing. The Marx. Oh, no, Hume say it, please. I love it. Go, say it. It's so good. It says that there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. And that's the part that gets quoted. But let me pull out the actual full-on quote. It says, figures often beguile me, particularly when I have the arranging of them myself, in which case the remark attributed to Disraeli would often apply with justice and force. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, and statistics. And the thing that sticks out to me about this Mm. is he is actually talking about how information is presented and Mm. how it can be so easily manipulated when you have no clue what goes into these statistics. And that is my argument about data ethics is that you need to know these things. You need to know what goes into it and you need to know how manipulation happens in the presentation of this. Yes. So what are some questions? It kind of as you wrap up here, I want to be uh, you know, respectful of your time. The, um, so thank you for your patience uh, as we kind of walk through this. <laughs> this what has been a what great are some great questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've had a great time. Thank you. Uh, what, are, uh, what are good questions to ask when you're faced with that blanket? Well, 70% of men do this or uh, 80% of everybody does this and it's like what are the questions we need to ask yeah what what are the questions that help you pierce that veil and say oh this is actually a good statistic or you know there's a little bit more nuance here yeah like the 70 percent of statistics are made up on the spot Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> the classic. Yeah. It's a classic. It's true. It's true. You know, there there's statistics made up on, on the spot all the time. So the question I ask is, uh, where did this data come from? Who generated the data? Are they trustworthy? Who's mm. paying for the data? Uh, is there a purpose to this data? What is that purpose? And again, going back to that, am I having an emotional reaction to this data? Mm. And you'll see this a lot in graphical presentations of data. So you, everyone's familiar with a pie chart that doesn't add up to 100%. <laughs> or, you know, maybe there's a graph where your y-axis isn't shown. So you have no idea if the increase and decrease shown in your graph is big or small. Or right. maybe you have data on two different scales presented on the same line with no differentiation of how those scales line up or why they are lined up the way they are. You know, there is always the question of what is the purpose of this graphic and what message is it conveying to me? And really, again, going back and taking the time and being reflective and going, is this confirming my bias? Mm. Yeah, no, that's really good. I, uh, are you familiar with storytelling with data? The book? I believe I have it on my shelf, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, is that a good uh, resource? Obviously, until your book comes out, right? That'll be the definitive, <laughs> the definitive work. The definitive um, work. But, yes. Uh, but uh, until, like, because that's what comes to mind. Um, uh, I think it's, and then there's a book called Lies with, uh, Lying with Statistics. There's like a very small book. That's uh, like it's like red and white stripes on the like whatever I bought on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, just trying to think of where people could find more information on this besides just telling them, you know, go Google it. Um, <laughs> go Google it. Uh, what, what are some what are some good uh, resources? Those are the two that come to mind for me. But what are uh, good resources for someone who wants to dig deeper into this until your book comes out? Um, so there are. There's some really great books by uh, Daniel Kahneman um, that he's written. There's a book called Noise. Um, and then there's, yes. it just came out recently. It's a, it's a great book about uh, how we make decisions based on information. Um, yeah. He also wrote another book that really helps you learn the difference between what's called type one and type two reasoning or fast mm. and slow, which is the title of the book. Um, And it's how we make decisions using very fast, quick thinking that's kind of automated in a lot of senses 
versus that slower type two thinking where we deliberate and we try to make, you know, um, very informed decisions. And so those two books mm. are phenomenal for that. Uh, gotcha. Then there's another book by Gerd Geigerenzer, and it's how people use data to make decisions, specifically in healthcare contexts in some of them. Um, and I cannot think of the title of that one off the top of my head. Gerd Grein, uh, Geigerenzer. G-I-G-E-R-E-N-Z-E-R. I'm sure if I put that into Google, Google will figure out what I want. So, <laughs> that's, yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, I, I just want to say thank you so much. I think this has been really helpful. Is there any last thoughts that you want to leave uh, our listeners with uh, before we end today? Ah, yes. So there is, so there are three tenets to scientific thinking. And these are, mm. these are things that I try to live by is that you question everything including experts. Like, you know, we're mm. human. We have our own problems and we have our own lens that we bring to the table. Question us, you know, but also be willing to accept answers when we bring you evidence. <laughs> so, but question everything. Um, importantly, sure. question yourself and your assumptions and your biases. And mm. also know that you can't know what you don't know. And so there's always room to learn, even when you yeah. are the expert in the room. Um, right. Maintain a healthy dose of open skepticism you know, tempered by a willingness to believe based on evidence. And so update your beliefs when you are presented evidence that may go against what you want to believe. And know that your opinion is not the same thing as a fact. <laughs> These are different things. Yes. Um, and finally, the last, the third core part of that is practice intellectual honesty. And that, that is simply saying it is okay to be wrong. And it is mm. okay to admit when you are wrong. It is not a failing to be wrong. It's actually how we learn. And we can't learn if we're never wrong, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So be okay being the wrong person sometimes and be willing to adjust and change and learn. Yeah, I think you're saying that very graciously. You know, uh, it's okay. I mean, I think it's important to be wrong sometimes. Like if yeah. you're never wrong, they're, they're, you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> like you have to be like, that means you're never learning. And so I, I, I love that. I think that's really coincides with the mission of what I'm trying to do with this podcast. So again, thank you for coming on. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. 